and we are live. It says we are live. Well, boom, boom, boom. okay. <laughs> well, um, good evening, everybody. It's Jeff, a godless scummer. Uh, welcome to my channel tonight. I have a very, very special guest um, joining me this evening. Um, he's uh, he's Chris Shelton. Now, uh, um, some of you may know that I've done one or two videos in the past where I've uh, talked about the Church of Scientology. Well, um, Chris lived it. He was in the Church of Scientology for 25 years, um, 17 of which he spent in the Sea Org. Sea Org. Um, Chris is out now, and he's now an outspoken. Hmm. Looks like we lost something because I'm the only one I'm seeing here on this stream right now. That had to. There we go. Guys, we still <laughs> live. So for some reason, that was just typical that my internet would go then. That I'd have a problem. No worries. Okay, so we are. Are we live? To chat. Are we still live? Looks we like are. we are. Yeah. Okay. So where was I? I? Was in the middle of introducing you. Yeah, you were in Scientology for twenty-five years. Um, you, um, Chris is now out of Scientology and outspoken critic uh, of Scientology and other destructive cults. Um, he's, he's appeared on Leah Rimini's award-winning uh, TV show, Scientology in the Aftermath. He is also the author of Scientology, A to Zenu, an insider's guide into what Scientology is really all about. Chris, welcome to the channel. How are you today? Thank you very much. <laughs> and, uh, I'm very happy to be here. Mm. Very happy to have you on. Yeah. Very, ha very happy to have you on. So uh, we, we just jump, we just jump right in, shall we? Absolutely, Ooh. let's do it. So let me say, uh, let me say first, just to just right off to to cool. contextualize Scientology for everybody right from the get go, and I and I don't do this often enough in my interview, so I I want to start doing this more. Scientology is a money making scam that uses religious cloaking to hide what it's really all about. So if you want to, if you want a simple explanation of what Scientology is, that's it. Now we can go to the details. <laughs> yeah, that's um, probably the best, uh, probably the very best um, explanation of what Scientology is at its real, at its real core. It, it, it is a money making scam. There's no two ways about that. Yeah. Uh, but I guess um, we should get to the, really to the beginning of how you got involved with the thing. And I guess. So, I mean, how I believe your parents were in Scientology, is that correct? Yeah. Uh, so, at what point did you decide this thing might be right for me? What was it attracted you about Scientology? I mean, how, how did they rope you in? Sure. Yeah. Is that, is that the best they, way to put it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I did their personality test. You know, okay. that, that, that thing they call an OCA. The, I was 15 years old. I'd, I'd been around Scientology since I was about four. You know, my parents got involved when I was pretty young and I grew up with it. I had, you know, the terminology, the the language, the beliefs and stuff. I thought we were, you know, I was raised to believe we were spiritual, spiritual entities, you know, uh, called Thetans. And we have this reactive mind that screws us up. And this was a general idea of what I what I understood about Scientology. And then when I was 15, my dad said, why don't you go check it out for yourself? And I did. And I was, uh, of course heavily biased to believe it because I'd been raised with it. I mean, I didn't have doubts and reservations going in. I just didn't think it was really going to do anything for me. And they convinced me that it was going to do everything for me. And it was going to change my life for the better. And it was going to be amazing. And I was going to get dates and communicate to girls and, <laughs> and have this awesome time in school. Uh, and everything was going to be <laughs> wonderful. You're going to get You're going to get You're going to be popular with the ladies. That's right. I think, it, I right. think that, that con could have easily worked on me at that age. Oh, big <laughs> time, man. Because I was desperate. I had not had a single date, right? I yeah. was just pathetic. And I, and I didn't yeah. know what to do. So Scientology said, well, we know what to do. And you, did, you take some classes and you'll do great. Well, I took some classes and I didn't do great, but I kind of convinced myself that I did because I was I was asking for more dates after that, <laughs> but I wasn't getting them, you know. So oh, yeah. anyway, yeah, that's kind of how it all started. 
Oh, okay. So, I mean, so you I mean you get so you but you've, obviously you do get very much into this thing. Um, you you start working for the church. Is that correct? Yeah, um, when I was right out of high school. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they recruited me pretty hard uh, because they only had, I mean, I was in Santa Barbara, California, a very nice seaside town, beautiful place, lifestyles of the rich and famous there. There's a lot of rich people there. Much and better all the people, than Southampton, England, or Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All the people who service them also live there, and they're all, the, they're all the middle class and poor people there. So I worked for the Church of Scientology there, and um, there were only about 10 or 11 staff members at the church. So they were desperate for more people. So they went in hard on me for like three straight days. They were just love bombing me, pounding on me, wanting yeah. me to be be part of staff. And that's where my view of the world actually changed because they convinced me over these three days, showing me all these L. Ron Hubbard quotes and news and bad news and media and stuff. They showed me how the world was going to hell in a handbasket and it was up to us, the Scientologists, to change that situation. So it was it was a well-intentioned idea to save the world. But the problem that I didn't see when I was you know, 17 years old going into this was how extreme of a viewpoint it was. It wasn't about just making the world a little bit of a better place or even about making a difference. It was about full-on saving the world. And that meant remaking the world in Scientology's image. And I thought, as a naive 17 year old coming fresh off of high school, you know, in a relatively small town, we didn't even live down in LA anymore, that I thought that made a total sense. I thought that was completely uh, doable and and wonderful and a great idea. And, and it was uh, very much a spirit like the movie, The Matrix, you know, it was a little group of, of, of plucky you know, heart. You know, amazing yeah. people who were going to change the world, and that you, was what I thought I was signing small group up for. Was out to save humanity. So, uh, exactly. Which is, I mean, you've you sort of mentioned this a little in your book that I mean, this this I mean, Scientologists basically they really believe they are doing this. I, I, if I'm correct, they really believe. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, we're you know we're we're going to bring this thing to the world, and you know the world's going to be a much better place if we you just you know. It's, it, 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 you know, Scientologists, it, I mean, obviously, I'm sure, I'm sure probably people like David Miscavige don't believe that at all. I think, you know, it, to him, it's a scam, I, I think. That's just, just my opinion. You you may be think that's, that's wrong. No, I, I, know, I but, agree. Yeah. I agree completely. Yeah, no. But only him. See, the other guys at the top mm. who serve him, service him, deal with him, take care of his, his material needs, all that kind of thing, they're all true believers. Yeah, they they're all in. He, I think, I I suspect, I have good, I have very good reasons to believe that he does not believe in Scientology to the same degree. However, we need to be clear though, because there are a couple things that people have said that gives the idea that that he, there are still certain aspects of it he might believe in, even if he knows that the whole thing is basically a scam. Mm. Okay, yeah. so well, if we'll get a little bit further into your story then um so you've been you i mean you worked as a staff member for was it seven or eight years or something um and then you take the the next big step um and it is a quite it's quite you know um it's quite an extreme step you joined the sea org now i suppose just um i suppose probably a few of my viewers know enough about scientology to know what sea org is but just in case you know anyone who watches this do, doesn't um can you explain what exactly is the sea org and why did you decide i need to join this i need to join the sea org yeah the sea org was um basically it would be similar to going to work at the vatican if you were a catholic it would be like that level it would be like all the moving up to the highest level of scientology the most core dedicated fanatical members they join what's called the sea organization and that's like sea is in the ocean right and um and it's naval it's a paramilitary naval outfit they have ranks and ratings and uniforms and yes sir no sir how high sir all that kind of thing and it's very it's 24 7 you're all in you don't do anything else but the sea org you don't have friends outside the sea org you know you know your family you see every few years maybe it's it's a dedicated all-in group and uh and they are fanatics 
and that's what I became. Yeah, I mean, because you sort of, because I mean, this is like because L. Ron Hubbard was in the U.S. Navy, wasn't it? I believe, and he he, he, he was. based he very much based this um this thing on the U.S. Navy only. I think some of the things, are, you know, some of the things I've sort of read about what goes on in the Sea Org, like, I think the Na U.S. Navy seems a much, uh, much um, better option. Um, certainly, the pay, certainly the pay appears to be better. Yeah, that's right. You also won't get keel hold in the Navy, like you know, <laughs> you, like you do. In yeah. the, I mean, that happened in the Sea Org, apparently, to a bunch of people. Yeah, well, I heard. So, I heard he was doing things like making people walk the plank. When, I mean, when the Sea Org was actually. Yeah, overboard. That's crazy. Yeah, they didn't put a plank out, but they threw people off the off the side of the boat. They called that overboarding, and awesome. keel holing was worse because there you yeah. get a rope under the under the boat and you have to drag somebody under it. I mean, it you can kill people doing that. It's oh, it's crazy yeah. what they got up to. Oh, it's un unbelievable. Um, yeah. it really is. Now, um, in your book, you actually mentioned something as well that you you know, I mean, far. Also, you know, not just being in the Sea Org for about three years, you were put on the RPF. Um, yeah, I, I was gonna say, and I, I might understand this might not be necessarily something you particularly want to relive, but <laughs> no worries. Um, but I uh, can you explain first of all what the RPF is and what sort of things are people in the RPF forced to do? Um, well, there's there are a lot of very really horrible, awful things as far as physical labor goes. I mean, if you could imagine the most degraded, you know, scum filled, worst working conditions. I mean, just take all the OSHA standards or workplace safety guidelines and standards that have been developed over the years. Just throw all that in the trash. That's all gone. We don't do any of that, right? If you want to put a ladder on top of a sawhorse on top of another ladder in order to get to something, because that's the only way you can feel like you can get the job done, then that's what you're going to do. You know, safety considerations were were to the side, and and most of the day on the RPF is spent doing heavy physical labor, uh, twelve to you know fifteen hours a day working on that stuff. And I'm talking about building things, construction, um, mill work, like actually raw building furniture, hanging off the side of buildings, doing sandblasting, retarring oh, roofs, gosh. doing grounds work. I mean, hard physical labor in the sun, wearing all black, by the way, because the Sea Org uniform is black t-shirt, black pants, black boots. So the sun's coming down on you all day. I mean, it was rough. And, um, and this went on for three straight years, every day, seven days a week. That's what I was doing. I, there was no holidays. There were no vacations. There was no seeing my wife. I wasn't living with my wife. When you're on the RPF, you are sequestered away from everybody else because you end up on the RPF because you have screwed up somehow and you've broken the rules of the Sea Org in some significant way. And so rather than kick you out of the Sea Org, you are given the second chance, right, quote unquote, to make good. And so I spent three years trying to make good uh and that's what i did and i and i did finish the program i got through it 75 percent or so of the people who do it don't finish it they 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 leave they get out and it's kind of a it's probably a perverted kind of pride i have that i actually finished this damn thing even though it was the most ridiculous thing ever and i really should have left yeah it's, you know uh, yeah i suppose that's probably does sound like a weird thing to take pride in i suppose it's the whole i've got through this i endured it kind of thing I suppose. yeah but, i didn't enjoy um, it but it was it's kind of like if no. you get through boot camp in the military or something i mean that's kind of an accomplishment i guess but the thing about the sea org is that it's all so wholly unnecessary there was no good reason for us to be doing what we did and the rules that we broke were ridiculous silly rules that uh, that we agreed to and we you know it was just extremism in action and the punishment that happens on the rpf is not just physical but it's also mostly psychological because you're you're made during during the course of the program you're made to go back using scientology techniques to recall all of your evil intentions and evil purposes that you've been carrying around with you for millennia in your past lives you got to go back and find all of them and pull them out you know and get rid of them using these scientology auditing techniques so for 3 years i was convincing myself of how evil and horrible and awful I was because of my past life experiences. 
And that is the mind fuckery that goes on there. Sorry, I, I don't know if I should swear or not. But oh, that's, I, that's... I, cuss, I cuss a lot on this channel. I've actually, I've actually been toning it down like, to, to be polite to okay. Chris. So, uh, sorry, um, yeah, sorry about that. But, before, uh, before I get back to um, yeah. your story, is it okay to take a couple of questions in the live chat at all? Absolutely. I see some people okay. asking questions. Yeah, so I see there's quite a few. Um, I think Lynn Shell asks, um, how do Scientologists re rectify the what's it the way to make money is to invent a religion? I'm assuming that's the thing that Hubbard is supposed to have said, but I'm guessing most Scientologists probably don't know that, do they? Or I don't know. No, they don't know that. And no. when they hear it, there are three documented times when L. Ron Hubbard supposedly told somebody that the way to make money is to start a religion or you know that that kind of thing. Um I believe he absolutely said those things. But when you're in Scientology, you are shown materials that indicates that they were all lying and that that was not true. And they and they the proof of this are these various quotes they have. But um, you know that's 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 only if it comes up. Most Scientologists don't even hear about that. I've, I've got a couple of questions relating to David Miscavige in the uh, yep. chat. First of all did you ever meet david miscavige and secondly what are the chances of someone rising to take over um i think i'm going to know the answer to that second one already but <laughs> yeah uh, ahead, i Chris. did i did meet miscavige i was in the same room as him three times i didn't work closely with him but i did get briefed by him and and uh and i had a i had conversations with him and one time we had a written conversation back and forth so um so yes i did and as far as somebody rising up and taking over i mean anything's possible you know the context really matters on that because miscavige might end up being perp walked out and go to jail or he might end up you know dying of natural causes in 20 years we we have no idea of what's going to happen so if and when that does happen, he gets removed or somehow taken off the scene, somebody will step up and take over or the whole thing will collapse. It, it depends utterly on how it all goes down. And that's why I, I, I kind of stay away from predictions. Yeah, okay. Well, if we get back to where, where I was gonna go next, is um because I, I, I had to ask you about this because you were still in the Sea Org. Um, around 2008 i believe you were still yep. in yep yep um now i was I on the rpf at that time you were on the rpf at the time okay yep. so i guess like you before 2008 i i, I just i'd only sort of heard of scientology as being this kind of that's uh, this kooky little thing that um tom cruise and john travolta are into i i, I didn't think probably see, seemed harmless enough i didn't know much about it um and i think something for me that was a game changer was anonymous um when they went after scientology and suddenly a lot of scientology's dirty laundry was aired um during that time but um you you were in um did you, during the time you were in did the anonymous campaign sort of um was that something that you were really aware of or did you you i mean how did it affect you at the time or was it something that you were sort of away from or yeah, on the RPF, I was very, very sequestered away from the rest of the crew, right? This, I, I was at Big Blue, the big, the big blue buildings with Scientology across the top. That's yeah. where I worked. The old hostel, and, yeah. Yeah, the, the old Cedar sinai uh, complex. So I, uh, and I was there for 17 years in the Sea Org, right? So three of them were on the RPF. I think it was 2005 to 2009 or eight or something like that in there. Um, and... So we did not get the full dose of Anonymous as everybody else did, but we did see the protests and stuff. We saw them marching around the complex and stuff because you couldn't help but see them. I mean, they were coming out all the time. And it was, I mean, I look back on it now and I'm like, great job, guys. You really did. Uh, that was an amazing thing they did, exposing Scientology internationally to the whole world. I mean, it was it was amazing. But being in at the time, we hated them, <laughs> right? We yeah. hated those guys. We thought they were complete dicks. Uh, we thought they didn't understand Scientology. We thought they didn't know what they were talking about. We thought they had just were spreading a bunch of lies. And so it was easy to just sort of, you know, negate them and the effect that they were having. The, the biggest thing about Anonymous was they showed the world that it was a real turning point because they showed the world that Scientology was not just a UFO cult or a kooky 
you know, goofy religion, that it was actually dangerous, that there were things going mm -hmm. on in Scientology that were harmful to people. And that had not, there'd been a lot of efforts by a lot of ex-Scientologists up until then to try to expose Scientology, but the media never really totally caught on the way they did when Anonymous came on the scene. And so that was uh, night and day. It's, it's really a before Anonymous and after Anonymous kind of thing yeah. if you look at it on the timeline. I mean, I think I mean I think I've heard um, Tony Ortega uh, um, say that you know that the internet in general um, has not been a good thing for Scientology. Um, it's not; it's something that they obviously. You, and you, I think you said something in your book along the lines of uh, L. Ron Hubbard was supposed to have all this knowledge of whatever, and he couldn't predict the internet. Exactly. But, but I think it's definitely that's not. Um, it's something they've, they've. But as I said, that was def anonymous. Was definitely my first awareness that there might be something more there's something more sinister about this thing than this just being this little kooky little thing that a few celebrities are into you know which uh, which is all it was to be before and tap until anonymous and then you start sort of and really that was the time you started a lot of the dirty laundry was aired and I, I mean I, so um, yeah exactly Pri prior to that david miscavige had been on nightline once and uh, that had gone on oh. for like 90 minutes. And there was a Time Magazine article expose back in 92 yeah. or 91 or something. But other than that, the media had not really been paying as much attention to Scientology as they as they should have been. Okay. Oh, a quick um, question from the uh, chat there from Global Mom. Um, what did they feed you while you were on the RPF? <laughs> Uh, yeah, <laughs> the same food the rest of the crew got, except that we got it later, last, so we had smaller portions, mm. and and the Sea Org is already giving in not a lot of food. I um, mean, the life in the Sea Org is not fun, and the, the right. galley, they have a main galley area where they make the food for the whole crew. Um, again, very military-like, and so you get runny eggs for breakfast, and, you know, Sundays is the big day, they make pancakes and stuff, right? Uh, so, you know, you're getting crap food and, um, and you're only got the, uh, the thing on the RPF is you've only got 15 minutes for lunch and 15 minutes for dinner. Sorry. So yeah, good, good timing. Right. Cause you, yeah, 20 minutes, tw technically you have 20 minutes, but, uh, you have to set up, break down and run back over to a muster. So, you know, it's basically 15 minutes. And I suppose, I suppose if you're get, if you're in the RPF getting your stuff last, you're probably only getting a few minutes to, yeah. Yeah, it was a sucky so, existence for sure. I mean, I was going to say now, um, obviously, eventually you got to the point you left the Sea Org. And this is um, something that I was, when I was reading your book that maybe um, – surprised me a little bit and i don't know i don't know why it really should have done it's just maybe it's the first time i'd really heard of this happening but um i mean i think uh, i mean scientology's got so many toxic policies but the one to me um that, that stands out is the disconnection policy which is obviously the, that's that's the policy that's breaking up families and stuff um but whilst reading your book i was sort of surprised to learn you sort of suffered a form of this before you'd even left the church right um and your your big offense was to come out of the sea org you, you weren't intending on leaving scientology at the time you just decided i've had i've had enough of the sea org but i mean is that sort of common i mean I, for that, that to happen in scientology if people if they come out of the sea org that there's there's almost like this pre-disconnection thing for lack of a better way of I don't know if that's something you could speak to because I just I don't know why that surprised me. It really shouldn't, but oh, totally, and it surprised me too. Even though it shouldn't have, I was I was really blown away by it. I had forgotten how extremist mind. Well, I I never really knew how extremist mindsets work at the time, but I'd forgotten how fanatical the Sea Org was about its own members and. Uh, I thought I'd be able to leave and still do Scientology and it wouldn't be a problem, you know, and um, no, it was a huge problem. The Sea Org are these dedicated, hardcore, they they think of themselves as like the special forces. Like they, spe they think of themselves as like the elite of the elite of the elite, the best of the best. L. Ron Hubbard says Scientologists are like the upper 10th of the upper 20th of all human beings. I mean, there, there's a lot of indoctrination in Scientology about how special you are. 
So they really go in on that. And the Sea Org are the most special, the most elite. And they're the most dedicated. They're the most fanatical. So when you leave that group, you're betraying the trust of all those people because there's only about 4,000 of them on the entire planet. <laughs> there's, it's a small group of people. And they really, they think of themselves as, as working their guts out, saving the world 24-7. I don't put my head on the pillow every night until I know I've done everything I can for Scientology. I mean, this is, these are hardcore people. So when you leave a group like that, any elite group like that, there is, there is some resentment generated. And because they resent you for leaving, they have the power inside the world of Scientology to make your life difficult. And they made my life hell. They made it very difficult. They didn't want me talking to other Scientologists, Facebook friends with Scientologists. They didn't want me on social media. They didn't want any of that. They wanted me to just go off and disappear for a while and then come crawling back to them in a year or two, begging to continue to do Scientology because that's what they expect people are going to do. And I didn't do that. I instead thought, well, I'm going to leave the Sea Org and I'm going to go do Scientology and I'm going to get up the bridge. And I'm going to be this wonderful Scientologist. And they were like, yeah, no, we're not really into you doing that. Yeah. <laughs> and they wanted to stop me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So they're not into you being happy when you leave the Sea Org. They want you miserable. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's, you know, I mean, I mean, I suppose in a way it's, it's probably, if anything, ha probably helped you leave, I'd imagine. <laughs> I mean, leave. Oh, big time. Yeah. It was together. a huge push. It was yeah. a huge push right out. And this is when I started realizing, and I and it really hit me hardest after I left, of course, that Scientology and these groups, these cults, all of them, they 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 really are best at making their own enemies. Mm. You know, they don't have to, they they they're always railing about bigotry and religious persecution and all that, but they're the source of their own problems through shunning, disconnection, fair game, you know, all the crap that Scientology and yeah. these other groups get up to. You know, they make their own problems. If they hadn't done any of that to me, I'd still be a Scientologist. Yeah. I mean, it's you know, it's that crazy. I mean, I suppose. I mean, this. I suppose this is the sort of time you. You, you know, the the lights are start uh, around about this time is probably when the time the lights are starting to come on to you. To you that this thing's oh, yeah. this thing's um this thing's not good. This thing's destructive. But there was a question I want to ask you. Um, you said one of the last things you ever did before you left the Church of Scientology in your book was you took a look at the sacred ot levels now we'll get on to xenu a bit later there's a question i've got to ask about that yeah yeah but, um but yeah um what was but really which you 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 because this this stuff's like this is like real sacred stuff in, in scientology isn't it you know you don't you, you know you just you don't look at this stuff before unless you've gone up all the levels but you one of the last things you said you did is you read them online. And I said, what is your reaction to actually reading them and thinking, what, you know, what's so <laughs> yeah. special about this? Yeah, I was, I was pissed. I was very, very, mm. very upset. Um, I had had this mystery built up for 27 years about OT3, about the OT levels, these high level uh, levels of indoctrination in Scientology. They're confidential. You can't know what's on them. And, and in the world of Scientology, they are kept secret. They're all over the internet, but no one in Scientology knows this stuff. They self-police and they actually do a decent job of it and they don't look. So for 27 years, I had not gone on the internet and looked to find out what this was all about. And um, when I did find out, well, it was a little anticlimactic. Let's just put it. That <laughs> yeah, way, I could right? imagine. <laughs> like, wait a minute. Yeah. I've been hot, I've been working my ass off, dedicatedly, dedicated my entire life to this, so I could learn about Xenu and body thetans. Like, are you kidding me right now? This is the big reveal. It, it was. It was. It was so anticlimactic. You are told in Scientology. You are. You are absolutely told in many, many different ways that the OT levels contain the secrets of the universe and of life itself. 
Uh, OT5, there are different levels. There's eight of these OT levels that you do one at a time. You climb the ladder. And you're told at OT5, it's the, it's, it's the living lightning of life itself. This is how it's marketed to yeah. psychologists, right? So, so I expected answers to questions I had about life. I did not expect Xenu and body things, you know? Yeah. And so needless to say, that was the final nail in the coffin. I was done at that point. I, I can imagine and it's um yeah, yeah I, I uh lynn's asked a couple of uh questions in the chat um yeah first of all it's just what's your take on shelly miscavige um obviously she's not been seen in public for quite a few years now yeah so i don't know if you had a take on that yeah, no, totally. Just basically, I I base my uh, knowledge on this on Tony Ortega's reporting. Uh, he's been he's been following up on that pretty closely, and she's relegated to an organization called the Church of Spiritual Technology, up in the mountains of San Bernardino, California. They, Miscavige just kind of pushed her away and exiled her to this sort of remote location up in the mountains near Lake Arrowhead, and she's just working up there. And uh, we don't really know anything more than that. We conjecture all kinds of things. But as far as what we know, that's pretty much all we know. Uh, and yeah. Miscavige doesn't want her around. That much is extremely clear. Um, but I don't think she's dead. I don't think she's been killed or something like that. She has more use being alive. And, and you know, if the police call or something, they can trot her out. And yes, I'm fine. Everything's wonderful. And back she goes to work. And uh, I imagine her life is 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 not great right now. Yeah, I can't, I can't. I can't imagine it's uh, pleasant at all. Um, yeah. Lynn, Lynn also asked, um, did, you know, uh, are your parents out of Scientology as well now as well? Yes, they are. They got out before I did. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was. I became the fanatic of the family. <laughs> they got involved. <laughs> they spent a lot of money through the eighties on it. Then they kind of left uh, in the nineties, and I stayed on until you know two thousand twelve when I left the Sea Org. Okay. Uh, what was I going to? I'm trying to looking at my notes to remember where I'm going to go sure. next. Yeah. Um, and this is obviously now you get to the point. You leave Scientology. Um, yep. You come out, and eventually, you decide to sort of do what you're doing now. Um, you, you become an outspoken critic of Scientology. Now, obviously, given the policies like fair game and what they do, to, and what Scientology has been known to do to critics in the past. Was this an easy fit decision to make? Because, I mean, you read some of the things. I mean, obviously, I've read Tony's book about what they did to Paulette Cooper back in the 70s, which is, you know, is, is almost, it's, you know, it almost sounds like the plot of some very far-fetched film, but no, this really happens. But but you're given what Scientology are known to do to critics on, and um, was this a real, was this, how difficult of a decision was this for you to say, no, I've got, I've got to speak out against this and, to hell with the what they try to do to me you know totally it was it was not an easy decision i'll put it that mm. way i had to give it some thought um at the time though i was so mad <laughs> that yeah. that helped me to push me in the direction of doing what i'm doing now um i was so upset with the fact that they had gotten away with what they'd gotten away with not only with me in my life and taking advantage of me and and wasting my time for 27 years, um, you know, trying to save the world. <laughs> uh, I mean, that was bad enough, you know, when you find out half your life has just been, you know, down the toilet. But then to find out about the deaths, to find out about the the cover-ups, the, the, the pedophilia, the sexual assaults, the rapes, et cetera, um, you know, that and, and the child abuse, the rampant child abuse, and the way that I had had, had not seen any of that all those years I was in that I hadn't seen it in a straight, clear manner that I that I'd had the skewed, culty perspective of all of it. I was very, very mad, and so I knew um, I needed to do something about this because I had. I think there was a sense of needing to make up for what I had done um, in contributing to this for so many years. And that set, that's been satisfied over the last seven years of working and doing what I do. I'm, I'm past that now. I don't feel, I don't act out of a sense of guilt anymore. 
But I think that motivated me for a couple of years, as well as the anger. And that overrode any personal considerations of safety or security or, you know, anything like that. Because I, I was like, okay, let's do this. And I got the assistance and cooperation of the people around me, my friends, my work, you know, the people who were employing me. And I set my life up so I was ready for it if it came. And then I just proceeded to move forward and do what I'm doing. Yeah. So I guess the follow up is, have they tried to do anything to you or? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, got a hate, I, will, I, got a, I will say I've seen the hate site. Yeah. I have, got a I hate have seen the hate site. Uh, I get trolled. I get followed. You know, I, well, I can't say that I get followed. I haven't seen anybody following me around, but I, get, I certainly get trolled and followed around on social media. That's for damn sure. These guys are relentless on this crap. Um, you know, they troll my channel, stuff like that. And you can kind of tell when you're dealing with a Scientologist versus a non-Scientologist. There's a there's a character difference in how they talk and how they write that, that you can kind of tell. So I, I can kind of see when they're coming after me and stuff. And they do that yeah. every every now and again. I will, I will say something on these. Because um, I, I, I did come across, I think it was your hate site. And I think it's, it was a hate site about, but they did about multiple critics, I think. That's right. I mean, I read them. I mean, I get the take that they're not really aimed to people like myself look, looking at this. I almost feel right. like they're aimed towards people who are still in Scientology. Would That's you agree right. with that? Because there's no way that, to me that I could go and read what's on that site about you and, and take that stuff seriously, just the way it's written and everything. It's, it's just... It's like, okay, this is just a clear hate site. It's who are they trying to convince with this? Um, exactly. It's, it yeah. is definitely specifically made for Scientologists because they can share the links. You know, that's the kind of internet Scientologists will read. Right? Yeah. They'll, they'll love to read the stuff hating on the critics, right? The SPs, we're the, S, we're the, we're the suppressive people, right? So yeah. you can't trust anything we say. Even though, factually, objectively speaking, that page about me is about 80% total nonsense. Mm. And about another 10% are half-truths. And then about 10% of it is actually true. So, yeah, you know. Yeah, because I remember, um, who was it? Was it um, Ron Miscavige? It, uh, it was the fa father of David Miscavige, because he's out and he's uh, an outspoken critic now. And... and because is he? Because he said because of the the auditing process in Scientology that where you a lot of your things you you've done a lot of things you may have confessed they're all written down or they're all recorded, yep. and and I think he mentioned there were some things that you know he'd done earlier in his life that he was really not proud of and and I think it was that obviously decision knowing that that stuff was going to come out if he um went went and became a critic but. It, it, you know, this is this is the thing, but then, then so you know, there, there is that element. There's, there might be an element, of, elements of truth in that. And I will say, in your book, you do actually, you are very truthful about some things that you perhaps where you, you know, you where you've um, sort of uh, had had your failings or whatever, and you know your flaws. You, but you were very honest about and open about that. We and that, and that was yeah. and that was calculatedly done because I knew yeah. the church could air all my dirty laundry right so i figured so, i'd beat them to it right yeah, yeah i cheated on my wife i did that right but yeah. okay okay you know i um, did that does that mean i should have been tortured physically and emotionally for three years and lied yeah. to for 27 etc no no it doesn't no, justify I, any of that you know i think that i don't i don't think the the punishment fits the crime should we say then that exactly that does, does and it, let's um, be clear that's that's my ex-wife by the way not my current yeah. wife i have not cheated on my current wife <laughs> yeah. yeah just to be yeah but just just to be clear you know exactly. that was a that was a marriage that had tanked well before i cheated on her so yeah. whatever but yeah, that was a thing. That and that's the kind of way that's how you have to play with Scientology. You have to be brutally honest about yourself because they're going to throw everything they can at you. And they have recordings and and recorded everything you've told them. They've got it in folders. They've got stacks and stacks of folders of information. It's an intelligence operation is really what Scientology is. It's not a church. No. And you know, that's kind of how it, how they run themselves. That's how they conduct themselves as like an intelligence operation. Yeah. I, I, so I don't know many other, I don't know many churches that have like, um, you know, 
um, intelligence wings like the Scientology does, you know. I, exactly. Yeah. Well, imagine it, imagine it like this for every for all the viewers out there, because this is a real simple concept. Imagine if you you understand Catholic confessional, right? You go to confession, you you, you know, confess your sins, and you get forgiveness and you get you know redemption. Well, imagine that the Catholic priest was writing all of it down while you were confessing. And then that that write up of what we were or videoing it. And then those recordings go into a folder with your name on it. And all of the accumulated confessions that you ever do go into those folders. And then you're told one day, you're like, I don't know if I want to be a Catholic anymore. And then you're told, oh, okay. Well, we'd like you to stay. We think you should stay as a Catholic because, you know, this is really the only truth in the world. And there is no other truth. And and if you leave, you're going to, you know succumb to all these lies and horribleness. Yeah, I get that, but I think I want to go. Okay, well, one other thing for you to consider is that you've told us an awful lot of information, and it would certainly be a shame if that information were to be exposed publicly. Okay, there's a there's a question coming in, in the chat, which is strangely kind of leading me to where I was going to go next, actually. Oh, what's that? This is said, she, this question, Daniel says, as an American, um, curious how UK folks feel about narcan on drug centers being allowed to open up there or Scientology really receiving achieving religious status in general uh, as a UK folk Danielle um I'll, 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 I might answer take that part on yeah, I'm curious like, about I, your didn't, answer. I didn't know narcan on drug centers were be opening up in the UK that's actually news to me I'm gonna have to look into that um as far as Scientology achieving like a religious status in general, uh, like, like tax exempt status, I think they've tried several times in the UK. Um, uh, and it's uh, there was the former Conservative MP Nicholas Soames, who I think is retired now, and he was the MP for East Grinstead, which is where Scientology have got one of their their very big um, bases, um, St. St. Hill, um, and you know I think so. That, that they sort of lobbied him for years and he went to bat for them. I don't think it's ever got anywhere in Parliament or, or anything for them achieving that. But that very much leads me into what I was going to ask, because it applies to Narcanon. Um, you know, in your book, you gave a uh, breakdown of this thing called the purification run rundown, which is, I suppose it's based really on this kind of old wife's tale that you can sweat sweat out um, things like alcohol or drugs from your system. Um, I think it's loosely based on that, that which, is, which is an old wife's tale I've kind of heard for years, actually. But um, but is what you, you did in that is, is, I mean, you obviously, you know, the purification rundown, Narcon, it's pure pseudoscience. I think we can agree on that. But you gave some very good tips, I think, really about spotting the pseudoscience in in that but what as you know you've gone into critical thinking and that and one of the things you speak out is what tips would you give people and you could use narcon as an example here of really spotting pseudoscience when it's being presented you know if people aren't sure what are the, what are the oh yeah no for? big time people got to research there's no substitute for it you got to do your research and that means looking to more than one source for information on things right more than one person more than one agency or whatever that's the first step um th and pseudoscience is something that is pushed on us all the time all the time uh from lots of different quarters and l ron hubbard loved this stuff um because you can use scientific sounding words and that's the thing is you got to look at the words. What words are they using, right? Are they making you detailed promises or are they saying, well, it could do this or it mm. might do this or in certain circumstances, this could occur. But that's that language is sort of couched by, you know, surrounded by all this other very formal academic sounding language that really isn't academic or formal sounding. And it's not hard to fool people who who don't know the difference. So. Um, so it really does require before you're going to start ingesting things into your body or taking part in programs that are supposed to alter the biochemical reactions or functions of your body, it, it really pays to take an hour or two or three and do some deep dive research and figure out what it is that these people are actually telling you, because it might not be 
what you think it is that they're telling you. The, the language can be very tricky. And that is something that you have to pay a lot of attention to with, with uh, any kind of scientific claims, really anywhere. Mm. Yeah, I think that's very good advice. I mean, this is something obviously, I, I, you know, I, I, I have dipped my toes into sort of debunking pseudoscience once or twice on my channel. Um, but, you know, I think it's also, it's this, you know, it's always good when you can hear other people give sort of good tips of how do we spot this stuff? And I think, yeah. you know, so it's something I can get a bit better at, at doing. But, um, well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the number one thing is to have a skeptical attitude. Yeah. If you hear something that sounds too good to be true, I mean, this is such an old adage, but it's yeah. so true. <laughs> if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Yeah. You know, progress is incremental. Yeah. Very, very rarely is progress a giant leap forward. So if somebody's yeah. promising you instant detox of your body, you know what I mean? Like, what? Are you, what? <laughs> you know, you or, gotta uh, you gotta look into yeah. that a little bit. You know, or, or Jim or Jim Baker claiming that his uh, you know diluted silver can kill kill the coronavirus. Exactly, yeah. or sticking bleach up your butt or whatever. I mean, the stuff that people get up to is it's very sad. It's very tragic that that people can be that gullible, but it really comes down to not doing your research and not being mm. skeptical. And that's that's the thing I want to. I, I, if I could get any. Oh, have we lost have we lost Chris. Chris, we've lost Chris. <laughs> I'll see if I can get him back here. Help! Oh. It's me that had the internet problems earlier. Now we've lost Chris. Let me see if I can get him back. Uh, what happened there? Ah, that was now, weird. Now it, it that was weird. It was um, it was me earlier that had the problem. Now you Just, dropped out. <laughs> weird. All it right. doesn't like uh, doesn't like us today. It doesn't. YouTube does not like us today. <laughs> It's, it's, yeah, it's, I was. I was. It's still they're running on up against us. Yeah, <laughs> maybe they are. Yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm gonna. Get, let's get to the. Let's get to the big one then. Um, yeah. I, mean, I understand this could be a fairly fairly long answer because you do devote um entire chapter in your book, kind of to the, to this question, I suppose. But it's because it really delves into sort of actual. Um, Scientology's beliefs, but um, now you, you said in your book that there is a quite a big because um, we all heard the famous story at OT three. This is where yeah. Zenu comes in, and but you said there's a lot of um, people that are outside of Scientology that would have a um, misconception of that. Um, and I guess I'll put you to ask you um, what those misconceptions might be. And also, if I understand correctly, it's not actually Xenu, if I'm correct. Reading it's Zemu. <laughs> That's yeah. right. So. Yeah, Hubbard, Hubbard wrote it in his own handwriting, and that is open for interpretation. And we've had this analyzed. People have looked at this. Tony O completely disagrees with me on this. He thinks I'm out to lunch. Whatever. This is a minutia point. It's not a big deal. Yeah. Uh, Zenu, Zemu. Yeah, L. Ron Hubbard used both interchangeably. Right. So it's like, OK, might be Zemu, might be Zenu. Um, the bigger issue is that science is that people call this whole Zenu thing as demonstrated or laid out on the South Park episode. And as you can read online, many, many different places, they call this Scientology's origin story. And it's not it's not an origin story. It's just it's a story of something that happened relatively short period of time ago in Scientology time frames. Scientologists believe that you've lived quadrillions of years into the past. So 76 million years ago is just a hop, skip, and a jump away, right? And 
the the after effects and the things that happened as a result of the whole Xenu story, I wrote a whole chapter about this, so I can't break it down in two sentences, but I can tell you that there's a lot more to the belief system and the structure of that belief than just Xenu. And that's, that's uh, something I like to point out to people because they think they know everything there is to know about Scientology's cosmology or its backstory, but they don't. They, the Xenu thing is only this much of it. It really is. It's a tiny amount. So I just like to point that out to people because because um, the crazy gets a lot crazier it, than than the than the just the Xenu story. I, yeah, I, I'll agree. Cause I, I I had a little glance through some of the OT levels, and uh, I think the Z, you know that's that's the bit everybody knows. But reading just through one or two of them, it, it's wow. It's like this. This is. That's just the beginning. Yeah, yeah that, that's the tip. a lot. The Zenu's the tip of the iceberg. It really that's is. Right. That's right. Um, but so okay, so I, so I, I didn't realize that there was a sort of disagreement on the pronoun on this on how it's. Uh, yeah, and it's, it's like it's, I said, it's, it's a, not. It's a. It's not a major thing. point. No, nah, it's not a big deal. I look at L. Ron Hubbard's handwriting and I see an M. It's pretty clear to me, right? Because you can mm. compare it to other places. Other people see an N. And at the end of the day, who cares? In a recorded lecture, L. Ron Hubbard literally did spell it out and say it. So as Zemu. So it's kind of like, well, I think L. Ron Hubbard was having his cake and eating it too. And at the end of the day, who cares, you know? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. But um, there's a lot more to it. This whole body Thetan thing, all of the, um, the, the cosmology, the intergalactic uh, civilizations that are out there, invader forces that have invaded Earth in the past and fought battles. And L. Ron Hubbard claimed that ancient Egypt was a landing area and a spaceport. And there were invader forces coming in and fighting each other. And I mean, he's got all kinds of stories, you know, mm. that, that he tells about this stuff. I think you've got a, very much got someone who appreciates what you do in the chat here, Chris. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. we. Uh, what part can you talk about that has happened? Oh, yeah. Yeah. As far as progress, I, do you want me to answer that? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Cool. Yeah. No, we've been making a little bit of progress. Not necessarily on the uh, legal front right now. There's there's some legal battles that are happening that are hot and heavy right now. Um, but Scientology has been exposed at a level that, that very few of these other cults have been. And, and, it's, and it's good because Scientology is one of the most dangerous destructive cults out there. Um, it's very, very complicated. It's got a lot of levels to it. There's a lot of a lot of lot to the mind control that they engage in. So it's good that the public now knows in a general sense that Scientology is not just kooky, it is destructive. And I think we've accomplished that through all the work of all of us. You know, Leah, Mike, Alex Gibney, Lawrence Wright, Tony Ortega. Uh, all the people who have come forward, all of them. And we are all standing on the shoulders of giants, by the way, because back in the 80s and 90s is when the OG critics really took the shellackings from Scientology. Those people's lives were ruined mm. before Scientology had become a household name or before anybody had known anything about all this stuff. So, um, so it's taken a lot, a lot of hard work to get us to where we're at now. But Scientology is basically toxic in the public's mind now. And we need, we really only need to keep it that way for a bit longer. And eventually they will, you know, tank out. That's how I see it happening at least. Okay. Um, just looking at, there was a question. Um, yeah, I'll put this up on the screen. Mm -hmm. Is Chris familiar with L. L. Ron Hubbard's Excalibur book? Uh, I know the yes. answer to this already, Chris, but go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am. I talk about it in my book, actually. I uh, spent quite a bit of time on it because I thought it was a fairly um, important part of the Scientology history. Uh, L. Ron Hubbard wrote a book. He called it The Dark Sword or Excalibur. Uh, I think there was another name for it originally, too. But he thought that he had hit on the... He thought he had had some kind of a, of a massive epiphany about the nature of life and, and, and people. And he wrote this book, or he might have written this book. It's, you know, I've, I've talked to two people who said they have seen it, have read it. So it, it, apparently it really does exist. And, um, and, and he thought that he could 
he thought he had an insight into how people work in such a way that he could control them and he could therefore control them to become better people. And that doesn't usually work so well. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but, but when you're an authoritarian or you have this kind of a megalomaniac mindset, then you think that makes perfect sense and you think you're being humanity, you know, humanity's savior. And that's where L. Ron Hubbard was coming from in his more, in his more, um, oh, I don't know, lucid moments. <laughs> you know? So anyway, he was a pretty funny guy. But that that was Excalibur. And there's a lot more to say about it, but I, I wrote it in my book, so I won't say it here. Okay. Um, I've got I've got one sort of final question written down for you. That this is something that, uh, a friend of when I when I said told someone I was going to be having you on, um, friend of mine wanted to ask want me to ask you this question. Now I think I already know the answer to this, but um, and that is, is there any way that Scientology as an organization would be capable? of reforming itself into something far less destructive. Now, I think I know the answer to this, but... Not while still calling it Scientology. <clears throat> no, <laughs> I didn't think so. Yeah, no. Nah, no, nah, they're never going to reform themselves out of this. There are ways to do it. I've actually made videos about it. Um, there are three things that they need to get rid of. Uh, and then they could actually be sort of a sensible self-help kind of group. But they're not going to get... And that would be the Office of Special Affairs, the OT levels, and disconnection. If they got rid of those three things, they would be a much tamer, softer, mellow version of themselves. But it also wouldn't be Scientology anymore because those three things are the things that make Scientology Scientology. So, yeah. you know, yeah. Okay. I mean, um, so I've, I've got, don't really have any other things. I don't know if you're free to take some few from the chat, if you've got a few more minutes. Absolutely. Let's do it. Well, also say, guys, you want to stick anything in the chat to ask Chris? Um, here's your opportunity. Um, but I will just say also, if I put this up on screen, um, thanks, thanks, Critical Cripple. He's uh putting up some uh, some links to your YouTube channel there, oh, Chris, thank you, your man. website, um, your book at Amazon, and um, at, and he's been smart enough to put the U US for Amazon in there. I'll put the UK version, <laughs> but it's all in all in the description in the uh, in the, in the channel, so. I'm not awesome. getting anything from the chat. You got, you know. But, well, sometimes people need a few know. minutes or whatever. But I would but. just say that um, if you know, if you uh, um, if you can't think of one now, um, Chris does do regular Q and A's on his channel, I believe. Don't is that, is that correct? You I do. do In fact, yeah. I've, I I've just crossed the 250 mark on Q and A shows. Wow. <laughs> so I've answered a lot of questions. I'm gonna say. <laughs> I, it's like, because uh, I, I was looking at that and I'm like, there's no way I'm going to be able to find questions that Chris has not been asked before. <laughs> it's just, there's no way. Um, so thank you very much, Lynn. Uh, that, that means that's first. I really appreciate that. Awesome. So, yeah, I think the other, I, I'll throw this out while, if, unless anybody else has something else, is. Um, the number one question that I used to get asked, and I'm actually getting it a lot less these days, and I think that's a good thing, is, um, you know, how stupid do you have to be to join a cult, right? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, to... I've got tired of that line, I must admit, yeah. Yeah, it's, it gets a little tiresome after a mm. while because it, it just comes from this position of, of you know, uh, what's the, what, what should I say, pretended altitude. I mean, you know, mm. no, nobody's better than anybody else at this stuff, but... Um, anyway, you don't have to be stupid to join a cult. The truth is that, um, evidence seems to suggest that it's actually people who are of above average intelligence who get wrangled into these groups more often than people of a below average intelligence. And that's just talking straight averages across society. That's not opinion. That's yeah. not like I'm trying to say that, you know, that there's smart people or stupid people. It's just, you have averages of this stuff. And, um, uh, and it's interesting. And I, and the reasoning for that is often that, um, or the thought on this is that more intelligent people don't get wrangled into it because uh, they're more intelligent. It's because they're more intelligent that they're able to come up with more justifications and rationalizations for why they should believe this stuff. And, and that sort of invites them in even more. They, they, they're they more susceptible to it because they think 
because they're smarter and they know they're smarter that they're somehow impervious to being fooled. And this is a this is a very dangerous bias that people have. Uh, anybody can be fooled. Anybody. So, oh, just thought I'd throw that out there. Yeah. David David Warley's. Uh, uh, we did touch on you. We did touch on. Oh yeah. a little bit earlier, but do you think they're ever likely to get um, a scavenging court? Nope, I don't. No. No, he, you know, here's what I can say about that. I hope that someone, some legal group out there can actually get educated on what Scientology actually is all about and how they operate before they bring a suit against Scientology so that they are prepared. And when that happens, then we might start seeing results like David Miscavige actually ending up in a courtroom. So I'll say, yes, it's possible that it could happen, but we need lawyers who are not just, you know, whatever. We need we need good ones. Yeah, yeah I mean, this is I mean, this is the thing. I mean, Scientology is itself has got an it's got an army of lawyers, you know, still, hasn't it? And it's, it's, oh, yeah. it's always I don't think one thing I don't think's changed an awful lot about it is it always seems to be in uh, in court somewhere. That's um, right. They're always litigating something. Yeah. Um, well, actually, I, I have to tell you what, what. One last kind of question I I will ask you. Um, yeah. I think because it's sort of I, I suppose it sort of baffled me um, a couple of years ago. Like, uh, I mean, what, what's your take on what's gone on with, over with Marty Rathbun over the last couple of years because he seems to be out in a critic and now it's it's almost seems like he's back in the fold now I, I don't know what's been going on there yeah I I won't say that he's back in the fold he he said and did things that will that will make that forever an, an impossibility but mm. he did get either bought off or blackmailed or somehow turned you know completely yeah. changed 180 degrees he was out and then he basically went back and made a bunch of videos that that invalidated or or nullified all of his work and mm. uh, against Scientology. And we we believe that uh, he was probably compromised because he had recently adopted a child. I think the church put pressure on him somehow in that direction. Yeah. And maybe money was involved. Maybe it wasn't. It's impossible for any of us to really say. So it really depends on your your opinion of the world as to whether you're going to think that he had to get bought off in order to do what he did, but he definitely took himself out of the picture. And that's about as kind a way as I can describe it. Yeah. I mean, cause it, it did seem very strange cause he was, they, the Rathbuns were in that lawsuit with something and that they a lawsuit that they very much looked like they were going to win as well at the time that he just suddenly just dropped the whole thing and then did, you know, and then so he went and did all those videos that going after, you know, other critics, like went after Leah Rimini, went after Mike Rinder. It, it did seem, yeah, I mean, I suppose the only, I suppose people, the only people who really know what's happened are people within the Church of Scientology and Marty Rathbun himself as to what's happened there, really. But I think it's very sad that, that that's happened, really. Me too. I thought it was very mm. sad. Um, we were, you know, we, I say, you know, we collectively, we, we, the ex-Scientology community had a lot invested in Marty Rathbun's court case and he was making great strides forward and he was closer than anybody's ever been to getting Miscavige into deposition. The court had actually uh, ruled that Miscavige had to submit a written deposition, which isn't great, but it was better than anything we'd gotten before. And then right after that happened, right after that happened, suddenly Marty's pulling the plug on the entire case and firing his lawyers and making videos, trashing Leah Remini and Mike Rinder. So, you know, mm. really? Yeah. You know? Like, no, I think they got to him. In fact, it's obvious that they got to him. How they got to him doesn't really matter. That they got to him is obvious. Yeah. And that's very sad. Um, I could talk a lot about Marty Rathbun's character or lack of it, but it, it, it doesn't matter because he's out of play now. He's not a part of this picture anymore. So I don't really care about the guy anymore, you know? Yeah. Uh Okay, one. I think it's one last question to finish finish up here. Um, well, there is a 
Do you consider Scientology a cult, a pyramid screen, business or a religion or a combination of, of any of those? <laughs> uh, it's not a pyramid scheme. It's not an MLM the same way that Amway is or Herbalife. Um, it is a business. I don't think it's a religion. I've argued that it's not. Um, I understand that there are people who truly do believe in its precepts, but that doesn't necessarily, to me, make it a, a legit religion. No. Yeah. Okay. The, uh, one last question came in just as I was saying that. Does Chris support Mark Bunker for Clearwater City Council? Absolutely. Uh, Mark is the only person in Clearwater running in the political scheme or, or area who seems to have a clue what Scientology is really all about. And yeah. uh, Clearwater is this tiny little town in Florida where Scientology has its main uh, base of operations and makes all of its money. So Scientology has basically taken over Clearwater. And we need, if, if Clearwater is ever going to get turned around, Mar we know Mark Bunker and many more like him are going to be necessary on the city council for sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, Chris, first of all, I say uh, thanks very much for joining me and agreeing to come on. Uh, I Absolutely. think this has been a fantastic conversation. Uh, I've really enjoyed this. And uh, people in the chat seem to think this, this has gone well as well. <laughs> um, so, but I was just said to people, um, obviously there are links in the de description to ch check out Chris's channel, um, check out his website. Uh, definitely, I seriously recommend giving um, um, Chris's book a read, or if you like me and like the audio versions, you can listen to it and Chris himself narrates it. It's <laughs> um, it very well worth it. You really want to dive into Scientology. So um, basically... This has been myself and Chris Shelton. Let's say good night to all of you guys. All right. Salute.